आज ही कहा Take your shakachi to the next level with this lesson. This lesson is ajikan. Ajikan means meditation on the letter A. That's A in Sanskrit. And you're wondering, why Sanskrit? Well, these are ancient characters. Buddhism comes from India, and A is the very first letter of the alphabet. So we're meditating on the origins of all language, of all meaning that we can see. And the key to this Understanding this character is to see with the heart. The last character is C, and uh, the Khan. It means to see with a, a sense of innate understanding. And so the first letter, A, you can look it up in the dictionary, and uh, you'll see the very first page of the Chinese dictionary. If you understand a Chinese character set, especially for the early years of, of schooling, uh, you'll be able to understand a lot of Chinese and Japanese and be understood by really billions of people around the world. It's fun, so I just like to learn about this. So I, I thought I'd share it with you because this is a shakachi piece about a, a character. Sanskrit, well, you've been using Sanskrit your whole life because of one, two, three. These are characters from the Hindus. They brought it to the Arabic uh, empire, the Abbasid empire, and uh, they were, hired to do the mathematics and the accounting for uh, the empire, the largest empire in the world at the time. So the Arabic numerals are really the Hindi numerals. And so here we are looking at a Sanskrit letter A. The next character, the one in the middle there, that's a character that means, means uh, character. So what you see is a house and then you see a little baby. So it's the roof of the house we're thinking about. So baby under the roof means in ancient Chinese to be prolific, to have children at home. There's so many writing systems, especially in Asia. And uh, it can be intimidating, but it can be uh, kind of fascinating and interesting. Uh, tell you a lot about life in the Bronze Age. Before written language, uh, these characters were carved uh, these symbols, pictures, pictograms, were carved on molds and then bronze bowls were cast inside of the bell where only the gods could read these characters. Uh, the messages were, were scribed with a sharp tool. And that's why you'll see those, those lines that are kind of uh, sharp and clear. And so you'll see a simplification of roof and a simplification of the baby, a, a stick figure. But as uh, ink was developed, uh, books were developed. Books were, of course, strips of bamboo. And so writing across the bamboo, characters got a different feel to it. In fact, it's pretty hard to make a circle. So you'll see that if you're going to say, write the symbol from mouth, oh, that would be rho in our language here. It's much easier to draw a square than a circle. And so that explains a lot of the geometry of these characters. When we go along with this study, you'll see that sometimes uh, the characters have an image, uh, sometimes it's a symbol, uh, and sometimes that character just represents a sound. Now take the last character, the one at the bottom. You see there's an eyeball that I can draw because I'm an artist, went to art school and all that. Uh, it's much easier for other people to just draw that square and so that became the symbol for eye. So what about seeing? Well, if you add some legs, uh, your character can now be activated, you are seeing, <laughs> your eye is seeing. So uh, you'll see that as a subcomponent in the last character at the bottom, which is the seeing part, seeing with the heart. Now this is taking Chakwachi to the next level. It's more advanced than the other pieces I've shown you on, on the internet but it's worth trying and uh, you may walk in, for example, when you walk into your lesson, traditionally in Japan, there'd be a waiting room, people would be waiting to see the sensei, somebody above you, somebody who's at a beginner level, you'll hear maybe a lesson you had reviewed or you'll hear something far above you. And so it gives you an inkling and a kind of a 
a, a vision into uh, some of the deeper mysteries of shakuhachi that lie ahead. Now, I learned this piece after I was playing for at least three years, and I played an hour a day. So that's uh, 360 hours a year times three years. So thousand some hours I played before my teacher brought out this piece. So just remember that you won't be able to just get a, a, uh, the score and a fingering chart and be able to do this. You really have to work at it and then you'll get to the point where you can take on a piece like Aji Khan. So this is the next level. This is level two. What I've done preparing for you is created this overview here. It's got all the sections numbered. I just took some arbitrary cutting points and then I'm gonna um, add notes to the different phrases and play them for you. And there'll be two parts to this video, so try to stick with it. And in any event, um, just enjoy it. Learn some of the ins and outs of shakuhachi. Even if you're not a player, I think it's quite fascinating. We're going to start with the very first phrase, number one. Now that tsure, high octave, bold and clean, so shaded, uh, su, sumeri, and then quickly come up for the re. Now you come out with a ringing tone, like almost ringing like a bell but it's the shape of a bamboo leaf that fades out slowly. So when you articulate, you're not bursting those ataris, you're just putting them in there as the sound fades away. So on to number two. Now remember that's a very fast articulation of the thumb, hole number five. And then that four, Okay, that's nice and clean. You're playing this G Mary in a low octave, which is a little unusual, but that's because you're going to, just with your lips, glide up to the upper octave, and then you strike four once more. And now the problem is that it's very hard to go from that G to an U. You'll, you'll feel, as you raise that fourth finger, when it says, where I say lift four gently, you'll feel that note just go up for a second, then put your head way down for the usan, but you've got um, these holes open like this, and you're fading it out. Now, this should be done on one breath. So now number three. We start that sumeri, very low, mysterious, but it's the upper octave. Now, because you're down all the way, you'll see that dip in the line in 3B um, that will come up and up and up and up and up, and then back down to the sumeri, and then back up is the dasho, and then hiku is pull back, atari, and then pull back. So, watch as I'm, I'll do 3A first. Three B. Back down again. This is a dasho. So I'll play that as one phrase now. Okay, number four. Now this row is very quiet and very low. And remember, you do one thing at a time. You do the Atari and you do the head shake as separate operations. You don't do them at the same time. One thing, then the next thing, then the next thing. So you wanna separate these ornaments so each of them is clear and distinct. That was all in one breath, and that's how you should be able to do this yourself. 
five. Once again, that ooh is very low, so um, you can still go further down on the ooh, which is not possible to summary, but on the ooh you can. So you'll see the head goes down and then up and up and up, so you're emphasizing the up. Now you almost break the sound at the beginning. And here's how it goes, the first breath. very simple it's kind of a recovery like for you and also the listener because that's a lot of technical things that happen so there has to be a break from a lot of intensity and articulation and back to the simplicity and the beauty of the sound so I'm saying this so that when you do that re make that re very pretty number six. So we're starting uh, towards the bottom and then you'll hear it uh, continue on the upper left and that's where it ends. So make sure you do this on one breath. So in 6A, there's a speeding up articulation of the thumb, and then you'll hear this head go down, up, now and down, you, you can shade with the top finger and bring it up again and glide it up, but really just shade it for the first time, and after that you can do the rest with the neck only. So um, there's a double chi at the end, so uh, this is almost a matter of personal taste. I put them in. Uh, you'll see later in this piece that it's, our, it's, it's called for the notation, and there are different versions of, of this piece, and I'm trying to play this as carefully as I can in the, in the technique and spirit of my teacher, Ronnie Selden, and his teacher, Yodo Kurahashi I, who uh, penned this music out. This is his handwriting. Number seven, you start with that sumeri very low, and then um, you're already down. Maybe you can go down a little bit further. So listen to the pitches. In the shakuhachi, you don't sag your notes at the end. You go down distinctly, but you can glide up. And it's considered not nice to just kind of sag your pitch. It's a characteristic of a, a woodwind uh, like this, especially a pure flute that has no reed and nothing, that when the volume of the, of the note is going down, there's less air and the tone will naturally drop. So because of that, it has a kind of a sagging down kind of feel. So you don't want to go there, you want to keep the notes up. And it's also part of Shakuhachi's style to not let your notes sag. So remember, you go down distinctly and then you may go up sharply, but you may glide up. But it's the down part you have to be careful of. For number eight, you'll, you'll start to feel that these patterns are repeating themselves. So in a way, it gets easier because once you've mastered this control with your neck, then these pieces, uh, you'll see the patterns repeat and the piece becomes manageable. Now, it's a physical muscle in your neck. So that's why it's not something that can be done quickly because it's just like building your body up for any physical activity. You will need to develop those muscles in your neck. That will give you the control. And also the muscles around the mouth. So when I was talking about playing an hour a day or however you can afford, I mean, obviously, if you're, you have a day job, or you're working so many hours a week, you may not have that much time. But the actual time playing, 
uh, will help you. And also the volume of your playing and practice will help you because if you can play loudly, these notes, these muscles are, are working harder and they will become firmer and that will give you more control when it comes to the delicacy. So now we're gonna do number eight and that'll be all in one breath. So did you hear how it was getting a little indistinct at the end? But that, that's good, that's good. Uh, it's better than pushing through and taking cheating breaths because that'll put emphasis on some of the notes that really shouldn't be emphasized. This is very carefully uh, designed to be played on the shakuhachi. And so uh, I know when learning the piece, you'll have to break it down into a few breaths, but that's is an aim that you'll have uh, to go. Uh, you can try playing softer to get through a long phrase, but I would not recommend that. Um, just do your best, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's a challenge, as you know. And now number nine. So it's a nice recovery phrase. Simple sure, simple atari, simple atari. When your head comes down, so you're shading with four on the way down, and then back up again, lift it, and then that re at the end. So that re has a little marking, so I say number five quickly, yes. But uh, remember, that's a weak symbol. That's uh, not a blast at the end. It's really all that you should keep in mind. Number 10. So, Tsutsu at the beginning, there's the two Atari, another two Atari, head back down, up, on the up. We have the four articulation for the ray. So then a head shake after the ray. And then a, the Atari at the end, not pronounced, but clear. So now a uh, nice breath for that deep uh, row, and then come up carefully, and then the head shake. Number 11. Now, the same start. We're going along as before. Uh, now, keep in mind that when we get to the bottom of that line, you see that row dimeri there. You're already playing a sumeri, so when you're going to the row meri, uh, you're, you're just rolling that finger down. So it rolls down just a little, little bit, and, then head, and the head stays down. And then you're coming up down on the second line. So for 12, we use some of the same techniques again. And uh, remember that's the shaded when we have those three curves that go up and up and up, up, shade it on the, on the beginning, and then you break it carefully. Okay, number 13. So now the ooh is such a beautiful note, uh, gives you a chance to really express what you can do with the shakuhachi, and uh, it's one of the reasons why many of us love this piece. So we start with a beautiful ooh, and uh, we do a lot of the work with the neck, being as precise as you can, and uh, double chi at the end, and then a uh, nice ma, and then a resolving uh, sure.
Now, 14, these are the last two phrases of the first half. So you'll see that uh, it takes you to a expectant place uh, with that, that kind of uh, fading out feeling at the end. So here we go. Uh, remember those deep breaths. I put an arrow in there just to <laughs> keep... I know I've been saying this through the whole video, but it's, it's very important. Of course, there are a few places you can take a cheap breath. But if you do cheat, just very quick, just a gulp of air. It's not an ending, it's, it's leading you to something. And that's the climax of the piece. That's the high section, the high sound. And so the next video will take you from that climactic part to the end of the piece. And so I hope you uh, break this up and try to master these little phrases and pay attention to all of these little ins and outs. They're beautiful and they're, uh, it's a feeling of accomplishment if, if you can get to this piece. And then if you can really get to know it, it's a wonderful piece and it's become my favorite. So good luck with your shakuhachi work and uh, enjoy yourself too, bye. Ran out of breath. <laughs> Cut.